Hi, everyone. Today, I'm very honored to have our guest today, Dr. Bruce Lipton. He began his scientific career as a cell biologist. He received his PhD degree from University of Virginia at Charlottesville before joining the Department of Anatomy at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine in 1973. And now he's an internationally recognized leader in bridging science and spirit, stem cell biologist, best-selling author of The Biology of Belief, and recipient of the 2009 Goy Peace Award. He has been a guest speaker on hundreds of TV and radio shows, as well as keynote presenter for national and international conferences. Welcome, Dr. Bruce. Well, I am so happy to be here with you. And plain Bruce is much better than Dr. Bruce. That scares me even. The word doctors is like, huh? get me away from doctors. <laughs> <laughs> I so deeply appreciate you coming on this program. I, I really value your work um, and I'm very excited to have you on, the, on this program. Well, I am glad to be here with you and I'm also glad to be here with your community because there's an opportunity for people to learn more about who they are and how powerful they are. Uh, when most of us feel that we're just victims of a world out of control, it turns out, oh my God, it's completely opposite. But that's for our story to unfold. For someone who is new to your work, uh, can you give us a background of the biology of belief? And then I'll ask you more questions on that. The conventional programming that most people have received, and even what I was teaching medical students, is the belief in what is called genetic control. And I say the character of your lives, not just your physical structure, but your behavioral structure, your emotional structure, uh, is associated with the genes that we have, okay? And the, the belief is oh, that genes turn on and off and control our biology. I say, well, this belief uh, also is really bad because it says that we have no control over our lives that these genes that we didn't pick and we can't change uh, determine the character of our lives. And all of a sudden it's like, well, I don't control the genes. Apparently the genes control themselves. So if they switch and give me cancer, it was like, I'm a victim of what's going on. Well, that is the conventional belief. In fact, that's what I was teaching medical students, that kind of belief. But my research uh, on stem cells years and years ago revealed that that's not true that the whole idea that genes turn on and off is completely false. If anybody ever says that, first flag should go up and say that's false because genes are blueprints and they're necessary because they the blueprints to make proteins and, and the proteins are the physical molecules that make up our body. So our physical expression is really due to the proteins. But I say, yeah, but the 100,000 different proteins and proteins wear out. So first of all, who creates the proteins and who replaces the proteins? And it comes down DNA. Uh, and then we were led to believe. Well, we were then led to believe that genes turn on and off by themselves. And so a you know, cancer gene turns on, I got, oh, I got cancer. I didn't do anything. So that makes us victims. The same control the biology, the environment, interacting with the cells, that control the environment, uh, I mean the genes and the behavior. So environment control genes, not genes controlling us. And I go, but that becomes important because it says that we can affect our environment, we can change our environment, we, we can change who, who we believe we are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I go, oh, well, wait a minute, if the environment and our beliefs are really influencing our genes, since we can change those, then we're not victims of the genes. We have mastery. We can find the environment that makes us work healthy and happy and, and live beautiful, or we could find ourselves in a negative environment and find that we got sick. And I say, yeah, but we control that. And so we go from the old belief that most people still have, my genes did that, and that makes me a victim because I don't control them. And it goes, okay, scratch, wrong idea, false, Genes are blueprints. And when, why is that relevant? Because it's like uh, you go into an architect's office and she's working on a blueprint and you ask her, is your blueprint on or off? And she would look at you like, what are you crazy? It's a blueprint. It isn't on and off. And I go, precisely. A gene is a blueprint, but it does not have on and off. A gene can be as a building blueprint and 
what we now know is our nervous system and our consciousness is like a contractor that is building our experience. And as such, it turns out that our beliefs and attitudes and the environment in which we live are the factors that control our genes. And therefore, by changing our beliefs, attitudes, lifestyle, uh, we also change our genetics. And then all of a sudden, it says, then uh, we can master our life. We can be controlling our life, e except that we find out, well, yeah, it's, it's controlled by the mind. And then the biggest loophole in the whole business is we say the mind, but there are actually two minds. And we have to distinguish them as two. They work together and different ways of learning and this has created all the problems in our world the two minds are one is called the conscious mind and one is called the subconscious mind the difference between them is the conscious mind is creative uh, it connects to our identity and our spirituality each of us has a unique conscious mind the subconscious mind is a record playback mechanism like a CD player you can you can put a whole bunch of programs on there and then select the button and play the behavior and I go this is what the subconscious mind is programs with behaviors so I say oh okay I say now here comes the problem conscious mind, creative mind we can create our life and create what we want heaven on earth you could have heaven on earth when you're operating from the conscious mind but here there's the problem here's exactly what the problem is the conscious mind can think and when it's thinking it doesn't do it outside of the body thinking is inside the body so if the conscious mind's paying attention at first is paying attention to the world in which you live but if you have a thought the conscious mind goes back inside. So I ask you, okay, tell, tell me what you're doing next week at 2 o'clock. And I say, well, where's the answer to that? Well, it's, it's not out here. It's in here. So I say, oh, to think. Now, this is, the, this is where the whole issue of our world comes down to. To think, my conscious mind has to go inside and let go of paying attention. I go, well, that means when you have a thought, you don't know where you are or what you're doing. What if you're driving the car and you have a thought and your conscious mind goes inside? I go, well, this is the beautiful part about what is called the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is autopilot. When the conscious mind is busy, the subconscious mind can drive the car because you know how to, it's a habit. Walking, talking, doing a job that you've always done, repetition has created habit. So, I can have a thought while driving the car, but my conscious mind's not in charge now. My subconscious mind is driving the car. Mm -hmm. So you can get into a conversation with the passenger as you're driving the car and talk and talk and talk, and then look out the window and realize, like, God, you haven't paid attention to the minutes talking. And all of a sudden, I say, well, how, how'd that happen? Who's driving? Uh, and, I, and here comes the important part. Your talking takes your conversation and makes that the topic of consciousness. So your consciousness is focusing on conversation, but it's not now paying attention to the road. So the subconscious becomes the driver. Well, the subconscious is more powerful, a computer even, than the conscious mind. So turning that job over to subconscious is really good. Let the subconscious stand, it's really pretty good. But now comes the interesting fact. So you're in the car, you have this conversation, you drove five minutes, and now I ask you this question. What was your conversation about? You go, oh, we talked about this and this and this. I go, great. Now I ask you the next question. What happened on the road during that five minutes? And you go, I don't know. I, I, I didn't see it. I, I was talking. I go, okay, now here's where the problem comes from. When the conscious mind is busy, the subconscious autopilot can take over. It doesn't need the conscious mind. It can drive the car without you. It knows where its destination is. It'll get you there. But the point about it is, when the conscious mind is busy talking, thinking, and then the subconscious mind is autopilot and takes over. But here's the problem. You can't see what was happening when the subconscious mind was taking over. Just as go back to the car. The subconscious mind drove the vehicle down the street, but you have no, you cannot even tell me what happened. Uh, how many cars passed, what colors, or what, what store did we just... You didn't, you didn't see that. You were thinking subconscious mind was taking you on the road. 
So here's the problem. The conscious mind is creative and has the connection to your spirituality and has wishes and desires. So when the conscious mind is driving the car, I'm driving with conscious mind. I'm driving to where I want to go. I'm going to create what I want to create. But now science reveals this fact. Only 5%, 5% of the day are you driving your vehicle with your conscious mind. The reason is 95% of the day we are thinking. Thinking's inside. So when you are thinking, by definition, you're not paying attention. But your life still goes on, driving the car, walking the street, whatever it is, because subconscious mind takes over. And I go, yeah, but did you see what the subconscious mind did when you weren't paying attention? You go, well, no, I, it's automatic. I, I expect it did what I thought I would do. And I go, no, the program plays whatever the program is. If it's a negative program, it'll result in a negative behavior, but you won't see it. You won't see it. Why? Because it's playing automatically and your mind is not looking at it. Your mind is inside. And I say, well, why is it relevant? 95% of our life is not coming from our conscious creative mind. It's coming from the program. The program is put into the mind between the last trimester of pregnancy and seven years of age. It is during this time that a child's brain is operating in record. Whatever it sees, it just downloads, just like a video recorder. It watches the mother's behavior, the father's behavior, the family behavior, the community behavior. And, how to, and so it learns how to be a member of a family, how to be a member of a community, not by studying, just by watching and observing their behavior, copying it, making it my behavior. So my behavior, my subconscious mind, didn't come from wishes and desires. It came from observing my mother and my father and family. And if they have negative behaviors, I have the same negative behaviors. Why? Because I programmed exactly what they did. Uh, and when the program was going in, in the first seven years, there was no conscious mind like observing, going, oh, that's a good program. Oh, this is a bad program. No, conscious mind wasn't working. All programs went in, good mm -hmm. and bad. And and now science tells us uh, uh, percent of the program of conscious mind are disempowering, self-sabotaging, limiting behaviors. I go, oh my God, that mind is running the show 95% of the time. And the big majority of them are, are sabotage behaviors. And I say, well, why is it important? Because I'm running those behaviors. I don't see them. Why? Conscious mind was busy thinking. But my thought is, of course, I'm going to run my life the way I desire. And I go, no. The moment the conscious mind is thinking, you're running your life according to the program, and the program came from other people, and therefore that's why the problems come into the system. So uh, an analogy for most people to get, very simple, very simple point is this. The movie The Matrix is not science fiction. It's a documentary. Everybody got programmed for seven years. I don't care where you live in the world. A baby is born. Its brain is in record seven years. And I go, wow. So I say, yeah, your life has already been programmed. Whatever you learned in those first seven years, your life will match that program. Good things, yes. Bad things, yep. Same thing. Going to be whatever it is. And I go, so I say, well, it's interesting because in the movie The Matrix, they say, yeah, everybody got programmed. But if you take the red pill. You take the red pill, you get out of the program. So now I'm going to give you a fun story for most people that have experienced it, and that is this. A, we've all been programmed just like the movie said. B, many of us at one point in our life for a short period have taken the red pill and changed our life instantly. I said, when was that? I say, when people fall in love. And they first fall in love and they meet this person and all of a sudden it's like the 24 hours later they're, oh my God, life is heaven on earth. Life is so beautiful. The food is good. The music is great. The companionship of this new love, everything is like, oh my God, it's heaven on earth. I say, your life could suck every day. <laughs> and then you meet this person 24 hours later, you have a different life experience. Life is heaven on earth. I said, it went from hell to heaven on earth in 24 hours. How'd that happen? And the answer is falling in love 
is one of the equivalents of a red pill. When you fall in love, you stop playing the programs. And the reason is why. There's a word called mindful, meaning you don't start thinking, you just be present, mindful. I go, why is it relevant? Because when you're mindful, you're not playing the program anymore. And so when this new person comes into your life, you're so excited. This isn't a time to think. This is a time to be, wow, I'm experiencing everything right now. Well, that means conscious mind's running it. I say, like that, you stop the program. I say, well, what happened? Stop playing the program. The old blah, 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 blah life stopped. Boom. As soon as you stop playing the program, the new heaven on earth life honeymoon played. I go, well, you mean you created heaven on earth? I said, yeah, but how? You stop playing the program. Oh, my God. Then how much heaven on earth can you have? I say, every day of your life, if you stop playing the program. And all of a sudden, you say, wow. And then all of a sudden, the reality is this. We are creating this. And this is not an accident. And the idea sounds so new agey. Oh, I'm creating my life. And I go, it's not new age. It is... The fundamental principle of quantum physics, and quantum physics like, oh, what the hell is that? That's complicated. I don't understand quantum physics. And I go, listen, fact number one, quantum physics is the most valid, truthful science on the planet. Every other science, biology, chemistry, uh, uh, all the other sciences, psychology, all these are not as valid or truthful as quantum physics. So quantum physics, when it says that's the principle, that's the principle and the principle of quantum physics so without even going into it is we are creating our life experiences with our consciousness and i say why is it relevant because we are creating this life experience and i go yeah and if you have an interference in your consciousness then what you're going to create is not what you want and it turns out it's the programming that interferes with us because we get negative programs. And when do we play them? When we're not paying attention. How much is that? 95% of the day. And I say, well, you're playing these negative programs. And what do you as the person see? You see that life isn't working out the way you want it to work out. And you go, well, it's not me. Why? I have visions of happiness and love and success. I have these visions. So it can't be me. It must be the universe stopping me from experiencing this. And I go, Correction, it's your own subconscious that is stopping you. When you stop playing the subconscious, immediately you have heaven on earth. And it's like, ah, it's the damn program that got us. And when we understand that, we also then have an opportunity to stay mindful, not play the program. And more importantly, we can rewrite the program. And that is like the amazing advent of life. Because you put in set your wishes and desires, then think about what it means. It means that 95% of the day, your subconscious will automatically take you toward wishes and desires without you even doing anything consciously. It will do what unconsciously is doing it. Taking you where you want. But if you put in the right program, you can manifest heaven on earth without even thinking about it. It's just automatic at that point. I have a question about that, um, Bruce. I have come across some people who have a really positive belief system and who do not expect results in a certain way, but things are not working out for them. How does biology of belief apply in those situations where... Okay, uh, we're here. A positive belief, by definition, comes from the conscious mind because that's a creative belief. Mm -hmm. I say, fine, I have all these positive beliefs. Every time I think about it, I go, yep, I got this positive belief. I say, you're even thinking about a positive belief? I say, why is it relevant? Because the moment you're even thinking about a positive belief, you're not even, your control is now from your subconscious, which has the old belief. I go, what's the point? The most we're conscious of a positive belief, how many, uh, what percent of your day will be positive? And I say, 5%. I say, that's not enough, 5%, because 95% of the day, the subconscious is going to keep running. I don't care what your positive beliefs are. So all of a sudden you realize positive beliefs only work when the subconscious agrees with the positive belief. 
But if you're having trouble and the subconscious doesn't agree with it, and I'm thinking consciously positive belief, and yet 95% of the day I'm playing the program negative, then my positive beliefs don't add up and they don't work. So positive beliefs work when you believe in the positive belief. So placebo. How does the placebo work? That's a positive belief. What is it? I'm sick. The doctor says this is the pill that is going to heal you. It's the newest, most new technology. It's perfect. You're going to. And I say, how does it work? I say, if you believe the doctor, which most people, that's a program because the doctor is professional and, and we're not. So when, when we're kids, we learn that the doctor knows about your health and you don't. <laughs> that's what we learn. So as we grow up and the doctor says, this is the pill that's going to heal you. And you believe the doctor because that's the program. You take the pill, you get well. And then you find out it was a sugar pill. So I say, then what the heck healed you? Not the sugar pill. You believe the doctor, and the doctor said this will make you well. So I'm leaving it well even before I took the pill. I say, the pill didn't do it. It was the belief that made you well, called placebo. Okay? And, and then, of course, the most important thing for the average person is, yeah, a positive belief can create healing, magic, wonder. It can create heaven on earth, positive belief. But what about negative belief? I go, ooh, negative belief is equally powerful, but it works in the opposite direction. A positive placebo can cure you of any disease. It's called nocebo, meaning negative thought. A negative thought can cause any disease. You can get cancer from a, a thought, not from a gene. Uh, and this is uh, the basis of the new biology. This is the basis of the new physics. Both of them agree your thoughts are creating, in biology, it's creating the genetic activity of your body to match your thought. In physics, the thought is creating the entire world that you're experiencing. Both of them say the same thing. And I go, why is this important? Because it's not a suggestion. It's a fact of science. And so all of a sudden, if you look at it and go, that's nice. I go, yeah, but that didn't change your behavior, did it? That's like reading a self-help book. As I said, you could read a self-help book mm -hmm. and you'll know all the right things to do. I can give you a test and say, did you understand what was in the book? And you take the test, you get 100. And I go, great. I say, now that you read the book, did your life change? You know, well, not really. I say, I'm smarter about these things, but my life is still the same. And I go, this is the most critical insight. The conscious mind can learn very easily. Mm -hmm. The subconscious mind doesn't learn that easily. So I could read the self-help book and my conscious mind understood everything in the book. My conscious mind could pass the test and all that. And I said, so what did my subconscious get? I said, didn't get anything. That's not how it learns. Reading a book is not how subconscious learns. I said, oh, I can educate my conscious mind separate from my subconscious mind. Go, That's the problem. We do. We get very smart. This, oh, wow, how to create the happy, healthful, wonderful life. I got all the ideas. I go, are, are you living it? Well, not really. I go, because you never translated the knowledge of conscious mind into the learning of the subconscious mind. And therefore, the subconscious mind will continue to have the same programs until you learn how to rewrite it. And there's a mechanism. And that's where the problem is. We didn't understand. You have to do something special to get the subconscious to learn. And so just becoming aware of, oh my God, these are the great rules of life. My life is still exactly the same. Why? Because my conscious mind did not translate that into my subconscious program. So basically then the issue is, well, oh, now the secret is, well, how do I rewrite the subconscious? And then all of a sudden the answers to life are right here. Uh, and the answers to life are simply this. The first seven years of a child's life, you learn because the brain is in theta, which is a lower vibration than consciousness. And I'm talking about reading your brain activity on your head called ethograph, so I could read the brain. Okay, um, The vibration of consciousness is higher. Theta is lower than consciousness, but it is hypnosis. And, and a ch child's brain in seven years is primarily in theta. So they're just being, they're in a state of hypnosis every moment. It's whatever they say, download, download. And so uh, the programs come in 
if you want to change the program, then hypnosis is a way to change the program. <laughs> That's how it learns. And so very quick insight is that, um, what, you know, how can I do hypnosis? Do I have to see a hypnotherapist? And I go, no, this is even much more easy at home. And it's this way. The vibrations are different levels. The lowest vibration when you put wires on a person's head, EEG, is called delta. That's sleeping. Theta is subconscious programming. The next higher vibration is called alpha. That's called calm consciousness. And there's a higher vibration called beta, which is like schoolroom focused work consciousness. A child starts off delta and then learns theta and then becomes alpha over time, then becomes beta. But an adult has all of them. So all of us now, we, we have all activity ranges. Here's the point. At work, you're in beta, high energy consciousness. You go home, you start to relax, consciousness calms down, that's alpha, calm consciousness. But at the moment you fall asleep, consciousness, falling asleep means disconnect consciousness. The moment you're falling asleep, alpha stops, and now you're in theta. Ah, that's the subconscious one. So it basically says, you just went to sleep. Why? Consciousness is gone. It's not here right now. It disappeared. And yet your brain is now operating in subconscious, meaning anything coming in is not going into the conscious mind, but it's going deeper into the subconscious. So you want to change a program, you put earphones on at night. And as you go to bed, the moment your conscious mind disconnects, whatever's playing on the program is going straight into subconscious hypnosis. So they have uh, these self-help programs that you can get that will, you know, let's say you want more health, you want more love, you want more money. They have programs that you can put on the earphones at night, go to bed and repeat this for a number of nights. And guess what? You've got the program and you were sleeping through the entire thing. And once the program is in, it's in there for the rest of your life. You don't have to even work on it. And it will do it automatically because whatever that program is, it's subconscious and it works 95% of the day. So instead of having a negative program, what if I put a positive one? I go, that'll work 95% of the day without you even working on it. So hypnosis is a way of changing a program, putting a new one in. After age seven, the brain is now operating all these different frequency levels, so uh, it's not in theta very much. I said, well, how does the subconscious learn? Because it learns new programs. You learn how to ride a bicycle. You learn how to drive a car. Do the time stay past. Uh, we learn all these things. Okay, and I say, oh, but I'm older than seven. How did I learn it? It's not hypnosis. I go, no. After age seven, repetition, making a habit repeating something. How long did it take you how to drive? Well, you had to get in a car. You had to practice how to drive. Practicing creates a repetition, which creates a program. So driving your car now, after you've done it for a few years, doesn't even require thinking. The subconscious knows how to drive the car. You programmed it how to do it. So, uh, uh, so after age seven, you can put new programs in, but you have to use a process called repetition, okay? And then lastly, there's a new energy psychology, meaning there's a psychology that can program with energy very quickly. Uh, on my website, just to help people real quickly, brucelipton.com, I have about 25 different energy psychology modalities listed with their websites. So you can identify these energy psychology modalities and say, well, what's useful about them? And here's what it is. They engage in the brain a process called super learning. Super learning is like the child. Think about it this way. A child in a family, there's three languages being spoken at the same time in this family. That three-year-old child is going to get all three languages and learn them virtually instantaneously, okay? I say, wait, take the same child, now it's 10 years old. I say, try and teach it one language. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, it's difficult to learn one language. I say, at three, it learned three languages. At 10, it's a problem learning one. I go, ah, before age seven, the brain was more super learning. It just had to experience it once and boom, it's going down in like this. If you engage that, process, then you can download new behavior just as fast as that kid. Mm -hmm. Well, energy psychology modalities are those things. So that means you could have a belief in your life that's sabotaging you your whole life. 
And I say in 10 minutes, using energy psychology, you can rewrite the belief. So this is the way out of the future, okay? Now, the, the issue is, last thing, so I say, I, you, you can rewrite your beliefs, but now your most important question at this moment is, so what are my beliefs? What are they? I got them when I was zero. I got them when I was one. I even got them before I was born. I have no idea what the heck these beliefs are. And I go, here's the fun answer, the fun answer. 95% of our life is coming from the subconscious programs. So our life is like a printout of these behaviors. I say, oh, to understand your program, just look at your life. And here's a simple point. Those things that you like that come into your life and they're there and they come to you, they come there because you have a program that But here's the thing. Anything that you seek in life and you have to work at it, struggle over, put effort into, sweat over, anything, I'm, I'm trying to get this. And I say, well, how are you going? I'm working real hard. I go, why are you working hard? And the answer is cool because inevitably that means the program that's built in does not support that. And you are not fighting the universe to get your success. You're fighting your own negative behavior working 95% of the day that says that's not part of my reality. And you want it to be because conscious mind's creative. It can have any reality. And subconscious says, no, only reality I know is what the program is. And that reality that you want doesn't match the program. And therefore, you're going to struggle. So the beautiful part for people simply is, what are your programs? Look at your life. What do you want that you seem to have trouble getting? Significance is inevitably that just means you have a program that doesn't support that. And they're going to struggle until forever. And I say, yeah, but if you rewrite the program, there's no struggle and it will do it automatically. And all of a sudden I say, wow, if you could take your wishes and desires from your conscious mind and turn those wishes and desires into programs in your subconscious mind, you know, here's the great consequence. You never have to even work on creating those wishes and desires. They will automatically be created because 95% of the day, the subconscious is working on creating them. It's like, oh my God, if I just change that program, the rest of my life is not struggle. No, it will automatically get there. Now you finally say something. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm curious, why does our system not listen to our conscious thoughts and it listens to our subconscious? Um, Isn't the conscious mind a lot more at a higher vibration? Yeah, but the issue is where's the attention? Whatever's the, the one that's controlling the nervous system is the one that controls the direction. I say, if you're thinking... That's the definition. It says, I'm not paying attention out there. I'm paying attention in here. I go, well, you're creating a life out there. And so I say, well, well, if you're not involved with creating out there because you're in here, then who is creating out there? And I say, that's the subconscious. So it's not the, the conscious can override the subconscious, but it has to be mindful. It has to not disappear into thought or get lost in something and not pay attention because the moment it disappears, the subconscious is going to kick back in anyway. So um, the wishes and desires only manifest when the conscious mind does not leave (laughs) the building. Like Elvis has left the building. No, my conscious mind has left the building. The moment my conscious mind left the building, then my life is completely controlled by my subconscious And that's like... Conscious can control it, but it can't disappear. It has to hold on to that driving wheel and continue driving with consciousness and not disappear in thought. And there is one more scenario I wanted to run through you. Uh, and I don't know if, it, if these are like exceptional cases where it has happened to me where there were situations where I was, I, I didn't think it, it's going to work out. It, it felt like very fearful and hopeless, but things worked out. So. I, maybe there were some programs that were like not working for me, but the results were positive. Um, so how do you explain the <laughs> biology of belief in, in those scenarios where you're, well, not, uh, you're, you're not in a positive situation, but you end up attracting... In a positive situation. Yeah. The, the answer could end up that way because, number one, the limitation that prevented you from getting to the positive thinking may not be associated with what you were thinking was the problem. 
I'll give an example. Let's say uh, I'm overweight, and I say I don't want this weight. So what's the program? Oh, my program for weight is wrong. So I'm going to put in there. I want I want this other weight. I want less weight. I want to make a program, and I have trouble getting there. And I go, oh, it turns out the weight wasn't because there was a weight program. The weight was because there was fear that you know somebody was going to bother you, and if you get big and fat, people leave you alone. Then I feel safe with with weight and i say but if you want to lose the weight it's not changing the weight you got to change the feeling of safe <laughs> and so sometimes uh there's a belief that interferes at one level but another belief might support what you're working on so your first conscious mind goes into the belief oh my god this isn't going to work but there's another belief in your life experience if i did this it seems to work and all of a sudden that other belief takes over so beliefs are not all you can put them all on one line what beliefs are like, uh, imagine a spider web with, you know, with all the circles and all the little links going around a circle. And then each link in a spider web is a belief. And the point is, well, I can knock out one belief, but I still got the web going here. I can knock out another belief. And so sometimes I knock out the belief where the problem is. And sometimes I knock out a belief. It may, be, may, may make me better, but it wasn't the problem. So I knocked out the belief and my life is still exactly the same as it was before because I didn't hit that belief. So the idea is, Identifying the exact belief of the problem is frequently difficult because there are indirect beliefs such as my feeling for safety will be controlling my weight, not my desire for weight controlling my weight. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, there are contributing factors that make a, a result. It's not just one thought. It's, it's a bunch of thoughts coming together. And one more thing I wanted to ask you was uh, about positive thinking um, one problem um, that could arise is maybe it could, and I, I need your input in this, um, maybe it could create more fear of fearful thoughts because now, especially those who do this work of positive thinking and positive beliefs, um, they end up feel. I, I feel like when you are in a fearful situation, you get more scared because you know that that's going to attract more bad situations. Uh, so you, you end up being more fearful of being uh, afraid how, how do you um, handle that yeah well the, the idea about it is this is when you move forward in your world and stimuli are coming in there are only three responses to any stimulus that comes into your life one you move to the stimulus because it's something you want like love you want love you gotta go to it okay or a stimulus comes in and scares you and threatens you, you don't move to it, you, you move away from it, okay? There's some stimuli that have no effect on your life. I, I call it elevator music. You go in the elevator and the music's playing, you're not going to dance, it's not going to kill you, it's just background. So three responses are, you go to a stimulus, you go away from a stimulus, or ignore a stimulus. Okay, now the problem is this, I have a vision of a very positive stimulus. That's a very positive stimulus, okay? But my behavior, my subconscious mind, gives me every reason why I can't get there. <laughs> and for every reason I can't get there, I start to pull away because there's no idea. I'm going away from it. And so that you have all this positive thinking that you want, but there are programs in there going, no, nope, that's not going to happen for you. <laughs> and it's not your conscious mind. So your conscious mind is saying, oh, my God, I, I know the reasons why it's not going to work. The conscious mind didn't do that. Conscious mind still has wishes and desires. It's the subconscious mind that takes over. And so the percentage of your life run by your subconscious mind is then the reflection of what percent of your program you will manifest. Mm -hmm. If you stop using your subconscious mind, then all programs are creative at that moment. And honeymoon effect, honey, uh, heaven on earth is a result of that. Why? There's no negative thing interfering with this process at all. I'm creating. But the moment the programs kick in, your best intentions cannot override those programs if they're playing. So the only way to win is not play the programs, be conscious, to rewrite the program. It's the only way out. You only got two choices. Don't use the program or put in the program you want. And if you try to say, I'm not going to use the program, I say, well, that, that's very nice, but 95% of your life is still going to come from that program, whether your conscious mind says, I'm going to use it or not. The only way you can stop using it is then stay conscious, stay mindful, mm -hmm. 
and then you by definition are not using it. But in today's world, mindfulness is very difficult. Everything about finances, the physical, domestic places, the job, everything coming in is like you can't help but think. So mindfulness is a great exercise, but very difficult to experience. So if you can't control it by not playing it, the only control you have left is to rewrite the existing program. And that's the that's your choice, A or B. Uh, and my next question was about your book, uh, The Hon Honeymoon Effect. Yes. Uh, someone I know interpreted your book uh, that um, um, you have, to him, it came off as if you have to be in a relationship to be oh, happy. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't make it clear. And I think I put it in the book, but not emphasized enough. The, the significance of love is that it's so attractive to you that you keep your conscious mind present to enjoy this experience. I go, oh. Well, in the book, I use relationships because most people at some time have had at least a little touch of this. But I also try to emphasize, like, no, it's what you love. Gardening, painting, cooking, whatever it is you do that keeps you present and occupied, I'm paying attention to my creativity, whatever it is. If you keep your conscious mind present in that process, then by definition, you are not playing the program. So doing these wonderful experiences, gardening, put your hands in the dirt. Mm -hmm. For some people, that's such a joy. I go, guess what? The joy is so good that I'm not thinking I want to experience the joy. I've got my hands in the dirt. I feel it. I love it. This is great. And I go, you're not thinking. You're experiencing. <gasps> well, then in that experiential phase, then your vision and your conscious mind is now in charge. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be love with people. It could be love with a pet. It could be love with a garden or a recipe. I, anything that keeps your mind right here because you're so engaged you that you, you, you like letting go. Yeah. You create that feeling by doing more of that. But that's why we, we, those are the things that we look forward to. It's like, oh, yeah, I got to go to work. But when I get home, I'm going to paint and I love my painting. I say, so you look forward to these experiences. Why? Because it's the happiest part of your life. Why? Because it has nothing to do with the programs. You're operating strictly from, I love this, what I'm doing. I go, if you love what you're doing, you keep your attention right here. And guess what? You're creating your love in front of your face whether it's a, a love of the gardening or a love of another person, you're creating it because that takes you to a place where you want to be and, and therefore where you keep your mind. And it's, being, it's being, being, what are you doing? I'm painting. Are you thinking, Oh man, uh, any thinking is just about the painting of what I'm creating. So it's not a, a program I'm creating uh, a life. And, and so that becomes important for people to, to understand that it does not have to be with another person at all. Uh, just doing something, engaging in something that keeps your attention right there because it's so enjoyable for you. That's whatever that is. That's it. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes, it's important. Thank you for asking. Um, and I also wanted to ask you about the biology of belief. Um, you don't completely deny the importance of allopathic medicine, uh, correct? Yes, but I, I can tell you I have a distinct viewpoint, a distinct belief. Mm -hmm. I believe that when it comes to trauma, mm -hmm. physical trauma, Modern allopathic medicine does miracles. I, I got uh, in an accident and my leg is broken. I'm not calling a chiropractor. I'm not going to cause a massage therapist. I don't care about that. I need a doctor. Why? Doctors know how to physically, like, physically adjust, fix, replace parts on the body, do all that stuff. Now I say, but what about chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's? cardiovascular disease. I go, no, don't deal with that. <laughs> the, 
because they are not using the modern understanding of epigenetics and quantum physics, which give us a different way of dealing with these issues. And they use pharmaceutical drugs. And pharmaceutical drugs are one of the biggest problems on this planet. Pharmaceutical drugs don't heal people. They just keep them steady enough so you keep buying more drugs. <laughs> if the drugs healed you, then it would be bad for business because you buy the drug once. You go, oh, I never need the drug again. I go, yeah, that's not their interest. So uh, while they actually do have drugs that can heal people, mm -hmm. they're not on the market. Only because if I sell you a drug that I heal you, you're not coming back to buy a drug again. So people unfortunately get on drugs and they get on, well, how long should I take these drugs? It's like, well, take them forever. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> uh, this is a drug dealer and you just, you, you're buying drugs forever. It's like, you don't need these drugs. These drugs are causing more problem than they're helping. That that level of medicine is one of the leading causes of death in the United States. Pharmaceutical drugs kill 300,000 people a year, not illegal drugs. That's only like 20,000, 30,000, even at the most. 10 times as many people are dying from prescription drugs. I go, drugs are drugs. When you understand the new biology, it's consciousness. <laughs> drugs, not necessary in healing. When you understand the power of consciousness. And then I go back and I say, quantum physics, most valid science on the planet, says the whole experience is consciousness. Change your consciousness, you change your experience. So the idea is, do I need pharmaceutical drugs? I go, God, no. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that is not a way of doing it. Healing with energy and consciousness is the way of controlling your biology. Thank you for sharing that. That's very valuable to know. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Jordan Peterson's work? Well, please explain quickly. Maybe I know it, but without um, the name. He's a professor. He talks about genetics. Um, he talks about how denying genetics um, is creating more social problems. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar <laughs> of his work. The genetics are causing a social problem? No, um, uh, it's, it, it's the program that's causing a social problem, which adjusts the genetics to complement the program. The genes didn't get there first. The program got there first. The genes come second. Mm -hmm. So the genes in the nucleus of the cell don't control the cell. They only respond to what's going on between the environment and the cell. And between the environment and the cell, of course, is your consciousness. My brain is, my nervous system is taking in all the information, sight, smell, uh, taste, sound, all that information is coming in. But the brain is organizing what I'm going to do with that and then controls the genetics to match what I need to do. So to start off and say the social problem comes from genetics, I go, absolutely not. The social problem comes from first programming, which can alter the genetics. And I say, well, you're going to blame the genes? I go, here's a fact. So this is a scientific fact, less than 1%, less than 1% of disease is connected to genetics. Mm -hmm. That's a very important number. Why? Because if we work on the pharmaceutical drugs and the genetics, how much of disease are we actually affecting with this? Less than 1%. Cardiovascular disease, over 90% of cardio, cardio disease is lifestyle and attitude diabetes type 2 is an epidemic nothing to do with anything wrong with the body it's all lifestyle and attitude and we start to find that all diseases have lifestyle attitude so 90 percent or more of illness on this planet has nothing to do that organically there's anything wrong with my biology or my genetics it's all how i program it i come in i'm a robot <laughs> at first I get programs downloaded at first, but then by age seven, I'll control my program. But if you don't understand that, then I don't care what age you are, you never learn how to control your program, you could be 50. You still don't know how to control your program. Until you learn this, you are a victim of the matrix. <laughs> when you learn this, you are free to create outside of what everybody believes. You can do the miracles. What are miracles? Miracles are people who had a belief that was against everybody else's belief. 
Oh, the doctor says, look, the spinal cord got severed. We know that can't ever get fixed again, right, doctors? And all the doctors, yeah, you can't fix that. And then the guy all of a sudden starts walking. They go, oh, that's a miracle. I go, no, he just didn't buy your belief that you can't do it. He had a belief that I can do it and made that an effort. And because he's creating, he can create what the hell he wanted. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, <laughs> it's the negative people that get in the way of creating the positive world. But if you ignore them and do your own positive work, then heaven on earth. And I, I have to say personally, 45 or more years of my life uh, it was not heaven on earth for me. I was very successfully in my profession. You know, I'm cell biologist and research. I did. That was real cool. I, my personal life sucked. <laughs> and, <clears throat> But my research led me to understand that my personal life was part of a program, which then allowed me to understand how to rewrite the program, which allowed me to change it to the extent that for the last 23 or four years, uh, I've had a heaven on earth experience. No doctors. Uh, it doesn't mean everything I want works out the way I want it, but it also means this. When it doesn't work out, I don't get any more like... <laughs> I recognize most of the times when something doesn't work out is because there was another way to get there and I didn't see it. And the universe was saying, no, no, don't go this way, go this way. Uh, and so, but I, in the old days, the universe said, don't go this way. And I go, yes, I can. <laughs> and I push on the universe. And then sometimes I succeed in getting just what I thought I wanted. And then when I got it, it's like, ooh, this is not exactly what I wanted. And it's sort of like the universe said, well, I was trying to tell you that, but you didn't pay any attention to that. Uh, and when you try to, you know, override the universe giving you a message, then it's like, well, you create it, but the universe was giving you a better opportunity. So the point is this, am I creating? Yes. Does it create everything I, I think I see and I want? I go, not everything. But then I also recognize those things that I didn't create. It's not because I can't have them. I just didn't understand what I was asking for. And the universe was kind enough to say, no, this is not what you really want. <laughs> And that led me to say, well, then I, there's another way to get what I want. That's when it works. So, yes, we are creating. Does it work? No. It just means you didn't see the whole picture and what would come from that. If you pushed on it the way I did and then end up with it, only then you realize, oh, it's not exactly what I was. I didn't want this. And and I was given the opportunity to not, not do that when the system said, no, nope, this is a struggle. <laughs> Go the other way. Uh, and that that's where it really becomes uh, important at that point in time. It's really great. Do you ever see um, these type of healing techniques coming into mainstream medicine where doctors can help us understand our own programs? Um, when you say mainstream medicine, I have trouble with that <clears throat> because mainstream medicine is not run by medical doctors. Mainstream medicine is run by pharmaceutical industry. It is not in the interest of the pharmaceutical industry that you empower yourself because if you empower yourself, you're not going to buy the drugs. So their efforts are always against any programs that offer self-empowerment. No, no, don't, don't try and do this. Just take the drug. No, the drug is simple. Here's a whole bottle. You don't have to do anything. Just take the drug. It's like, oh, that, that's so crazy. And yet, that medical profession is not controlled by the practitioners. It is controlled by the financial industry behind it. It makes money. And this is where the problem comes from. Health should not be a for-profit industry. It is against the nature of being human. Human is to be compassionate. How can you call it compassionate when you make health care a profit business? And I say, well, what does that mean? I say, you are charging people more than the service to do what? Make a profit. And so, oh, you're making a profit off of sick people? Hell, that's not humane at all. That's, a, that's inhumane. And medicine is inhumane because it is there to make business out of people's illness. And this, uh, and you know what I love? They're raising the price so much that people say, I can't afford to be, I can't afford to use your system. I can't afford to go to the doctor. I can't afford, two thirds of the people when polled in the United States, two thirds, cannot afford to have an issue. They go to the emergency room and spend $1,000. 
People do not even have $1,000 available at that moment to pay for go to emergency room. What's the point? The cost in medicine are so crazy, so exorbitant that what's happened? 1% got the money, they'll see the doctor. 99%, they don't got the money, they're going to find a better way to heal themselves. And this is the opening door of the evolution. It says, how can I heal myself without going to the doctor? And the answer is a lot better than going to the doctor <laughs> using these other technologies. It's aware you, uh, you gave it away when you went to the doctor because you said, how much does that cost? And whatever number they said, you said, okay. I go, are you kidding me? My brother took a hep C program with the, this new pill that they came out with. A hundred thousand dollars to get the pills necessary for this process. A hundred thousand dollars? What's the average person going to do that has hep C? They got no hundred thousand dollars. They don't even have insurance policy. Oh, we're going to let them die. Why? Well, if you had a hundred thousand dollars, I would have given you the pill. It's like, whoa, this is not humanitarian at all. It is complete profit from sickness people. So I will only put my money into them in the one that I know that they can do because it's physical, mechanical, and, I, and somebody can help me with it right now. But it becomes any kind of chronic illness from dementia to cardiovascular disease to diabetes, whatever, I can heal better without the help of allopathic medicine. Fact. Uh, and in your book, you also draw some similarities between uh, cell evolution and human evolution. Yes. Can you share more about that? Yeah. Uh, they can, they, remember, our beliefs control our, our lives and our beliefs control our culture. A culture is based on what everybody believes. When people change the belief, they change the culture. I go, yeah. So I say, and what is our culture based on? I said, our culture is based on Darwinian theory of evolution. I said, well, what is that? And I said, well, in a summary, Darwinian theory means survival of the fittest in the struggle for existence. I said, what does that mean? He says, well, life is a hardship. There's competition among all of us to see who's going to survive. And if you want to survive, you've got to work harder. And you've got to be the best and you've got to be the fittest. Otherwise, you're going to be at the bottom and you're going to get wiped out. So we struggle. Life is like a struggle to survive the struggle of the survival of the fittest in <laughs> the struggle for life. It's like. Who said life was a struggle? I said, it was a false understanding from before Darwin, and Darwin put it into the theory. And then everybody buys a theory. Now it's a culture. We live in a doggy dog world. We live in a world where uh, uh, if you need to make a profit and you have to step on somebody, it's like, that's fine, because it says, the theory says, it's okay for me to step on them. I'm more fit. Screw them. I'm fit. And, and a world based on this competition and struggle and fighting and all that has led to a whole world based on struggle, competition, and fighting. It's a belief. Mm -hmm. And a new theory of evolution says, no, it's not based on that. It's based on cooperation. A simple point. A garden is cooperation among all the plants and animals that are making a garden. I said, so we inherited a garden when we evolved, and through competition, we destroyed the garden. And that's why we're facing what is called an extinction right now, human extinction. And I said, well, why is this relevant? Because it says competition is not the force. Competition is the force of competition. The more people cooperate, the more energy that we have to create. And so the point about it is this. So what is our evolution? Is it me beating you because I can then show I'm fitter than you are and I win the prize? 1% of the people believe that. And they have the 1%. That 1% has almost all the money. <laughs> the other ones are struggling underneath in a survival. It's like this. I go, no. Cooperation. We are coming together as a world community. It's the younger generation that is leading this evolution. They're called the millennials. Everybody under 40 is part of this generation. And I say, why is it relevant? Because number one, what's different between the millennials and the previous uh, baby boomers or wherever they are? I go, number one, the millennials are a generation connected by the Internet. I say, why is that relevant? 
That's a global nervous system. That means all humans can be online at one time and see something. I say, why is it real? I said, a human we're a single entity. When there's health in the community, that's harmony in the community. When there's disharmony, that's disease in the community. And I go, oh, because all the cells are working in harmony as a community. I go, humans, evolution is not the separation that we've been programmed to have. I'm separated in this state. You're separated in that state. I'm competing against you in that state. That's an old belief system. The evolution is break the barriers down and recognize we are all part of the same biology. We are all cells, a human cells, in a bigger thing called humanity. Humanity does not have borders that separate the cells. It doesn't have cultures that fight each other because if your cells fight each other, that's called autoimmune disease, self-destruction. And it's interesting because the biggest form of disease on the planet is autoimmune disease at this moment. Why? Well, it's reflecting what's going on on the outside. If people are killing each other, that's autoimmune disease among people. And so what is the evolution? The breakdown of the limitations, the separations, the coming together in community and harmony and compassion, unity, and this will return a garden. But the competition, fighting, struggle of Darwinian theory, which we created as our cultural belief, that belief is causing the problems on this planet. So we really have to come to a new belief that says, uh-uh, it's not fighting that evolution comes from, it's coming together in harmony that evolution comes from. How do you see it evolving? Um, how do you see our planet evolving from where we are at right now? Well, it's interesting because a culture has a structure. So I say the culture that we were just in or in still a little bit has this structure. But I say a new culture, a new culture is based on different beliefs and different, different way of life. So it has this structure. I say, well, if you want to go from this structure to this structure, guess what you have to do? You have to break down the older structure and in the process build the new structure. So I say, where are we? I say, we're in the process of breaking down the old structure. And that's where all the problems in the planet are showing up all over the place. It's not just in one country. Every country's got some kind of problem going on all at the same time. I say, yeah, because the old structure that has shaped this world has to break down because the old structure is causing the problem. So if I take an old structure and make a new structure, there's an in-between part that looks like it's neither structure. It's not this or this yet. It's in the middle. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a caterpillar goes into the cocoon and it's going to turn into a butterfly. Well, the caterpillar has this structure. The butterfly has this structure. I say, what the heck happened in the cocoon? The caterpillar structure broke down into soup <laughs> and the cells reformed in a different form. Human civilization is like in the cocoon phase. We're coming out of the Darwinian competition struggle world, breaking it down, but we haven't fully created the new world yet. So it's like you open up the cocoon in the middle between the caterpillar and the butterfly. You got a soup. I go, we're in the soup. <laughs> we're in the soup because the old structure has to move into a new structure, which means the old structure has to fall apart because you can't build on the old structure. That's where the problem is. And if something falls apart, then it's like chaos. And then I look at the world and I go, oh, my God, I can't believe the amount of chaos on this planet at one time. And I go, this is an important point because what it really reflects for us is that the chaos we're in is the interface between an old evolution and a new evolution. And the young millennial generation are providing a structure for the new evolution. And the older people are still trying to hold on to the old one. It's like, no, no, let it go. <laughs> it's time to move into here. So uh, we're excitable. We're in the moment. We're in the change. We're in a soup that says, where are we going? I said, well, we have the potential to go really good, but it doesn't mean we're going to make it either. <laughs> We've been here before and we didn't make it. And 
we could try it again now. And uh, we have a pretty good possibility of getting through and creating the final evolution, which is all people are cells in one body of humanity. Thank you so much for that positive note. I, I'm excited by it because I, I know that the old structure is the problem and as I see the old structure falling down it doesn't scare me at all as a matter of fact if the old structure doesn't fall down then I would be scared so when I see the chaos and most people are going oh the world's falling apart and I go no no the world's coming into something new <laughs> the old one's falling apart the new one is is forming at the same time so to make your life happy let go of the old one and start to join onto the community of the new one because then it's moving up. The old one is moving down. So enjoy your life. Build a new civilization. And along those lines of the new structure, um, what are your thoughts on this idea that uh, a lot of people are talking about nowadays called um, universal basic income? Uh, where the basic rent and food um, is... Yes. is what are your uh, thoughts on that? Is, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I'll tell you. Yes, that evolution repeats the patterns over and over again. I say that the human body is a community of 50 trillion cells. Cells have jobs. Skeletal cell, skin cell, brain cell, liver cell. I say, oh, so, uh, and another thing about biology, all the functions that we see, in our body, digestion, respiration, cardiovascular, immune, immune system, these are all present in single cells. So single cells are like miniature people. They have the same needs that we have. Why? Because our needs are to feed the cells. Cells need oxygen, water, food. So when we are hungry and thirsty, that's to feed the cells, okay? So we're creating an environment for the cells to work in, okay? Now, why this really becomes important is at some point is that when we start to understand the nature of this, I say, well, cells are miniature people. I go, yeah, and I say, guess what? They have jobs. I say, guess what? They get paid. Cells get paid. I go, well, not. Uh, there's actually money in the system. It's called ATP. It's a unit of energy. It's like fuel. The more ATP you have, the more fuel. You have to run your life. So here's the point. The economy could be measured by ATP. How much ATP is in the system? And here's the thing. A human body has been around hundreds of thousands of years. If you understand how a community of 50 trillion citizens can live in harmony in what is called a healthy body, and there's an economy in there, you just have to say, how do they do it? <laughs> Because if you understand how they did it, it's the principle that we need because we're just all a bunch of cells anyway. So here's the three levels of economy. Number one, there is no wealth, ATP, excess in the human body until every cell gets the basics of life. Until every cell has food, until every cell has a job, until every cell has safety. There's no money. You have to use that to create Okay, we all got the basics. We can live. Once all the cells, there's enough energy to support every cell's function, extra energy that we acquire through our activities is wealth. And I say, then I say, well, what? Then I say, cells can earn and keep their wealth. So ATP molecules are like coins and they accumulate in the cells. And it's not an equal salary. Neurons get paid a heck of a lot more than a skin cell gets paid. Well, first of all, the skin cell's got everything it needs anyway in the first place. It's got food, shelter, safety, and all that, okay? But it doesn't have necessarily a big reserve of energy. It, but a, a need reserve of energy. Why? Because if it runs out of energy in a moment, the neuron could die. That's why I'll touch it to the brain. So you got to give those cells that need that have more value in, in contributing something, more money. So it's not communism, everybody got the same pay. Neurons got paid more than skin cells. Skin cells don't care why. Well, first of all, as long as they got everything, they can aspire, they can think about it or whatever, share. Okay, so I say, first level of economy in a civilization, either cells or people, is provide basics for everybody in the, in the, in the community. Everybody gets the basics. You get past that wealth, then you can start accumulating wealth. Now, here comes the caveat. Here comes the stop, and that is this. 
molecules of ATP are physical. You can only have so many molecules in the cell that start to interfere with the function of the cell. So it says, ah, cells can earn their money and put it in the form of ATP, but there's a limit amount how much they can ultimately put in a cell. If they get beyond too much ATP, it interferes with the function anyway. So it says, A, first level economy, everybody gets the basics. B, second level economy, you get extra money now you can store in your account, but it's related to your job, how much you can store, and there's a limit of how much you can store. 60 billion, oh, that's a hell of a lot of money. Can a person live on a billion? Well, I would think so. <laughs> if you can't make a most perfect, wonderful life on a billion dollars, you got a problem here, you know? Do you need 60? No. I say, why? What about the other 59 billion? I said, you took that away from the other people and you were excessive in this. And I say, when, how does the body do it? I say, level one, everybody gets basic. Level two, you can make a maximum amount of money. Level three, any production beyond the, that level goes back into the community bank. Any energy beyond what the soil cells can store and what everybody got, extra energy is a deposit. It's called a fat deposit. <laughs> but it's an energy deposit. Okay, and, and why it becomes important is simply this, is that the community energy is necessary for community projects. You break a leg, then what you need is energy to replace the broken leg, right? And I say, if you say to the liver cell, you say, liver cell, okay, you pay for the broken leg, and liver cell, what do you mean me pay for the leg? It's like, oh, no, we have a community bank. We made enough energy in here. We can fix the leg and we can create this. Even having a child, a woman cannot have a child if the system doesn't see there's enough opportunity for the energy to support the development of that child. If it, if they, it doesn't exist, then the system will not even let the woman become pregnant. Why? It's like, you can't start a baby halfway and say, I ran out of money. <laughs> it's like, no. So, the said, this will solve all of our problems. One, everybody would have a safe place to live and food to live on and something to do. That right away makes peace. Second, it also encourages people to do better because if you can accumulate more money by something special, mm -hmm. that will encourage people to do special and create more. But then it also says once you've created past a certain amount of money, the money is really not yours. You're now sucking it out of the system. It's trying to go back into the system as the bank and support the community. If we built our economy on that basis, then we would have the same success as cells. And the cellular success, well, they've been here a few hundred thousand years, and when you are happy and healthy in your body, that means 50 trillion cells are happy and living in harmony and health when you are. And all of a sudden it says, well, if I can get 50 trillion cells to live in harmony, I sure as heck can help a few billion people on the planet. And that's the lesson that we're working on. That's a very insightful comparison uh, you have drawn. Uh, do, do you think uh, we can, is it, do you think it's realistic to think that maybe we can fix poverty in near time future? Or do you think that's going to take a very long time? Nope. It's going to be cataclysmic. It has to. We don't have a lot of time. We're facing an extinction process. Uh, the, the data reveals, just for example, in 2048, there will be no fish in the ocean. It's like, what? A whole planet with no fish in the ocean? 2048, 30 years from now. That since 1970, they did a survey of how many animals were on the planet. And they just did it again two years ago. And guess what? 62% of the population of animals has disappeared. We only have one third the number of animals on this planet that we had since 1970. We're killing ourselves, we're killing the planet, and it says we have to make changes. I say, well, what, how many hundreds of years do you think we have? And it's like, hundreds of years? No, you gotta make changes within this hundred years. You, have to, you will not make it past this hundred years if you don't make these changes now. So all of a sudden it says, oh, well then evolution is right on our doorstep and evolution has to happen right now. And we are engaged in that evolution as we look at the chaos going on. So it's a sign that says, yep, it's in process. And when will it occur? <laughs> within a few, a few short years, there'll be a whole evolutionary change on this planet if we intend to survive. And that's, that's required. If it doesn't happen, 
hey, populations have been here before and they disappeared. We could just do it again. This, I hope not. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is an interesting phase we are going through right now. Yes, this is make it or break it. Either we're going to make our evolution survive or we will be going extinct within a few decades. And so that's like... has little tiny report sometime on a little piece on the column that says, oh, environmental catastrophe or something like that. And no, we're reading about the Kardashians or we're reading about Trump. And it's like, man, that little article down there, that was that's the most important article in the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. The tiny thing down there is like, the world's going to sink. Wake up. <laughs> Wake up now because it's in process. And if we collectively work, we'll survive. If we don't become collective, it's not going to work. So... I'm with you on this, keeping my eyes open, seeing where the heck are we? And I'm happy at this moment because I know the changes we see in our world are changes of evolution. And and I'm hoping for the best. If not, hey, I only got a few more years left. I'll have to come back and do it again next time. So, uh, But I would love to see it work before I go. <laughs> Is there a message you would like to share with the viewers today? Well, in a closing message, the most important thing is this. We have been led to believe that we are victims of a world out of control. And every science, especially the new epigenetics and especially the quantum physics, reveal this is a completely false story. That we are responsible for this world and we're not victims in a world, we're creators. Except that we've been programmed to be powerless so other people can have power. But if we take back our power... Not only can you live heaven on earth every day and realize what a gift life is. What is a gift when it works beautifully? It's like, oh my God, life is so visually stunning. It smells good. It tastes good. It feels good. And I say, this is really what we were here for. And if we get our powers back, I can assure you, you will experience this as a way of life. If we don't get our powers back, It'll end and we'll come back again in a different way. <laughs> uh, and so I just want people to know there's a very positive future in the face of the chaos that we're experiencing. That in fact, if there was no chaos, I'd be more afraid right now than any other time. Chaos means it's going to change and because it has to. So instead of living in fear, we walk forward every day going, wow, old things falling apart, but something new and better has the opportunity to come in. And that happens, we all move into the future. And ultimately, when we get it, then Earth actually is heaven. If everybody on Earth believes heaven uh, and Earth are the same, then Earth is heaven. <laughs> and, and that's what we're working for. So uh, I wish that for you. I wish that for everyone out there, that we wake up and look at it and go, yeah, it's kind of strange, but I'm really glad it's happening because if it doesn't get strange, it's not the uh, just good right now. So let's, uh... Thank you so much for this empowering message, Bruce. And I so deeply appreciate you, your work, and your enthusiasm with which you share your work. I, <laughs> I deeply value your work. Uh, I so appreciate this opportunity to be with you and to uh, be with the community. Because all of us are going to work together. And if we work together, uh, the, I, I've already touched this because I had to reprogram my life to fit my science and my, it's like, oh my God, I demonstrated to myself something I never even believed in. Uh, and now I'm living heaven on earth. I say, wow, this is available to everybody. It's just the program. Why? Because I didn't have other, I didn't accident. I got it because, oh my God, there's a science. And when you use that science, we can create that beautiful experience that we all want. And uh, so thank you so much for letting me talk to your community, because if we all start working together, there's this beautiful vision right in front of us. Yes, I'm positive and hopeful about that. Me too. Well, thank you so much. And thank everybody out there. I appreciate this. And if they want to find out more about you, it's your main website is brucelipton.com. 
Yes, so simple. BruceLipton.com. A lot of free information. Download videos, articles, interviews, all kinds of things free because knowledge is power and I don't want to hold anything back because I need the people to re-empower themselves because I trust the population more than the government. So hello population. Let's, let's go. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the viewers. If you like this video and find it informative, please remember to leave your comment or like it. Thanks.